Even before the Soviet Union ultimately collapsed back in 1991, ethnic fault lines in the southern Caucasus were already starting to unravel. Azerbaijan and Armenia would fight in a brutal six-year war. The conflict came to an uneasy pause in 1994 with Armenia's occupation of the Nagorno-Karabakh region, which is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan. Now the two countries are at war once again in the worst fighting since their fragile truce was signed. Haider Abbasi has more. The war machine is in full gear. Azerbaijan's military pounds Armenian targets from the ground and the air. These strikes are met with attacks from Armenia. Days of fighting have killed at least 100 people and wounded more. The dead include soldiers and civilians from both sides. It's not clear how the latest hostilities over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh began. Ilham Aliyev ve Bernard Dirakan var çakazma verestin ancele paterazma kan gortogutsunleri. Da hayjo gortin hay tararvat paterazme. Da paterazme mer anka hutan azat hutan yev arjana pat hutan dem. And the world is watching. The UN Security Council has called for an immediate end to the fighting. It's also demanded the parties sit down for negotiations. But it seems the neighbors are in no mood for talking. Skirmishes between Azerbaijan and Armenia aren't rare. Yet this latest flare-up is the worst between the rivals for decades. And it all centers on Nagorno-Karabakh. The area falls within Azerbaijan's borders. War broke out in 1988 after an Armenian militia tried to seize the region. Following a ceasefire in 1994, Nagorno-Karabakh stayed under Armenian control. At least 30,000 people were killed in that conflict and more than a million displaced. Although the leaders of Nagorno-Karabakh declared independence, it's not recognized as a state by any country. The UN agrees that Karabakh is occupied and is land that must be returned to Azerbaijan. At the moment, there's no sign of either side laying down its arms. The war only seems to be intensifying. These men in Azerbaijan are volunteering to fight in the military. Many of them weren't even born when Nagorno-Karabakh was lost to Armenian forces. I hope we go and make it back. Let's come back with good news. I love all our people. Be strong. The fear now is that the fighting could expand beyond the enclave and into other territories of Armenia and Azerbaijan. The international community wants to prevent that. And it's now asking, how can the years-long stalemate finally come to an end? Heyda Abasi, Straight Talk. And joining me now from Washington, D.C., is Elin Suleymanov, who is the Azerbaijani ambassador to the United States, and from Istanbul, Matthew Bryza, who is the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Ambassador Elin, where is this fighting headed and where does your country stand amid the crisis? Uh, good, mo uh, good morning. It's good morning in Washington. So, well, the fighting still continues, and uh, Azerbaijan has always said that our main goal is to end the illegal occupation of Azerbaijani lands by Armenian forces. We do it because we believe that the lasting peace can only be found as a result of the end of this occupation. And so. This will end when uh, the fighting will end, of course, and we want to have a negotiations, a substantive talks, which will be aimed at ending this uh, occupation and this conflict. But for that, there needs to be a commitment from the Armenian side to begin the withdrawal of Armenian troops as demanded by the relevant UN Security Council resolutions and international law. Okay, do you believe that Armenia will come to the negotiations table? Uh, I don't know. I hope so. But over the last uh, couple of years, the Armenian leadership has shown every indication and made every move to make sure 
that the negoti negotiations are undermined, that the peace process in is interrupted, and every single achievement which was uh, elaborated by the international community, including the Minsk group over the last 20 uh, plus years, has been undermined and rejected by the Armenian side. I mean, just think about this. Uh, Prime Minister of Armenia says, uh, Karabakh is Armenia, and that's it. And once he says that, what's there to negotiate? So I think, uh, and I do hope, I do hope that they come back to negotiations. That's important. So after flare-ups in July in Tovus, uh, Matthew, which isn't a, a, even a disputed region, what's the significant of, uh, significance of these clashes? What could you tell us about the timing and sides' determination um, not to stand down? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, in my experience, having been not, not just the U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, but I was the U.S. mediator of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for three years, uh, the U.S. co-chair of the Minsk group. This, so this is the by far the most serious fighting and the lowest point uh, in the relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan since, since the 1994 ceasefire. Um, the reason why it happened now, I believe, is, is what Ambassador Suleimanov was getting at. I mean, I... You know, we're supposed to be, and I was impartial as a mediator. Um, impartiality, though, doesn't mean being equal in a false way. Mm -hmm. um, Armenia is in breach of international law, and its leader has done what Ambassador Suleimanov said over the course of the past year, at least. It, it has abandoned the fra framework that had been negotiated for 14 or 15 years, and even preliminarily agreed by the then president of Armenia, Serj Sarkisyan, and current president Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, he's just, he's given up on the negotiating process. So, um, Ambassador Elin, how is the U.S. administration reacting to the, uh, this crisis? U.S. presidential candidate Joe, Joe Biden asked the Trump administration to call on leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia to end hostilities and also um, demand others like Turkey to stay out of this conflict. Why do you think Biden is so uneasy about Turkey's support for Azerbaijan? I think that two, we're facing two things. Uh, one is the U.S. administration in general, and most American politicians have a voice support for yeah. immediate cessation of hostilities and a return to negotiations, substantive negotiations. I want to emphasize that that's an important message coming from uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and the, and the Trump administration. Uh, former VIP Biden mentioned the role of Turkey, but in the previous uh, more official statement, he actually mentioned the role of Russia as well. I, uh, it was a tweet in which he mentioned Turkey, so we have to be a little bit careful not to uh, attach too much attention to the tweet rather than official statements. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a certain, uh, there is a certain uh, campaign which tries to cast Turkey as the problem here. While we all know that the main problem is Armenia's occupation of Azerbaijani land, Turkey is not involved in this conflict. We all know this. President Ali stated it very clearly. Uh, Turkey is not a party to this conflict. So why do, you think, why do you think ground. some leaders pointing the finger on Turkey, especially Francis Macron? Because it's convenient, because, uh, because it is convenient, because this is a way to cover up and to distract attention from the ongoing occupation and the war crimes committed by Armenian uh, leaders. In fact, uh, this doesn't help Armenia at all. It doesn't help Armenian people, because at the end of the day, they're also on the receiving side of all this conflict. So I would, uh, it's not surprising, it's, you know, it's actually a very old uh, Soviet technique called the uh, propaganda, Bolshevik propaganda thing, where you just throw in certain uh, falsehoods there and then ask people to wait for people to get back and they get distracted by all this. The same with this uh, allegations about Turkey shooting down the plane and then about Turkey uh, recruiting some fighters to, from Syria. All of these things are complete falsehoods. They're easily disproven. And there are radars, there's inf enough information on the ground, the sure. satellite images. They all disprove that. So in the 21st century, uh, to keep repeating these lies of a desperate uh, Armenian government which doesn't know how to justify its own failures to the people, it's, it's just la laughable. So um, Matthew has Nagorno-Karabakh become the third flashpoint after Syria and Libya, where Turkey and Russia have found themselves uh, in, on the opposite sides of a conflict. And how do you think this latest crisis will affect the two country relations? I don't think it's gotten there yet. Um, Russia has been very restrained in its statements. 
Remarkably so when you consider that Armenia is a treaty ally of Russia under the Collective Security Treaty Organization. What Russia has done up until now is call on both sides, n not the opponent of its ally, but both sides uh, to stop the fighting. And, and that, this is a very significant point, the next one as well. Uh, in the joint statement of President Putin, President Trump and President Macron yesterday, um, all three called on the resumption of negotiations with no preconditions. It's only Armenia that is applying preconditions to going back to negotiations. So, so Putin is actually leaning very hard on Armenia. So because of that, uh, I think that, and because of how effectively Turkey has fought uh, against the Russians in Syria and in Libya, I think President Putin is steering clear of a confrontation with Turkey. Now, Turkey doesn't have troops fighting on the ground, so you know it, this may be this could be a diplomatic flashpoint, but I don't see it becoming a military flashpoint between Russia and Turkey. Ambassador Elin, do you believe that that's why Russia has not yet thrown its full support to Armenia? And what's actually Moscow's stance towards the Yerevan government, especially the uh, prime minister? I cannot comment on the Moscow's view of the official Yerevan at the moment. But what I can say that we have been somewhat surprised by the ongoing supplies of Russian uh, military equipment to Armenia over the last uh, over the last couple of months, including over the territory of Iran, our neighbor. We have a very good neighborly relations with the Russian Federation. We are partners in many uh, on many areas. So. In reality, I think our Russian friends understand that Azerbaijan is fighting on its own territory. This is a most fundamental point. Azerbaijan has not crossed any international border. We're fighting within our internationally recognized territories, trying to restore our territorial integrity and protect our own people and uh, protect our civilians. The Russians understand that we do not plan to attack Armenia. President Aliyev clearly stated we have no military goals on the ob objectives on Armenian territory. So therefore, the treaty obligations uh, which Russia has with I mean, do not apply. Now, I, I don't think there is a significant confrontation between Russia uh, and uh, Turkey. I know there was a discussion, diplomatic discussion. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Matthew said, Turkey is not involved on, in the ground. I don't like, actually, as an Azerbaijani citizen, I, I represent an independent nation. We have a very well-trained army. You could see that they're doing very well. This is not 1990s. Uh, all these years, Azerbaijan has developed a viable, quite strong state. So why, why keep accusing and minimizing what Azerbaijan is doing? They're our soldiers. They're our citizens. We have overwhelming support for, for uh, the liberation of our territories and for defense of our civilians from this society. It's, it's unified. So I don't know why this is becoming this uh, rumor mill which keeps going on and on. And if I may, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, as you rightly said, in July, there was a clearly a cross-border attack, a, a cross-international border in Tovuz. And that was a clear violation of all accepted behavior. But uh, you also mentioned that the territory is disputed. Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding areas are not disputed territories. They're internationally Occupied. absolutely rec recognized as part of Azerbaijan. So... Uh, they're occupied, but the status of these territories is not a uh, dispute. So, um, Matthew, with both countries engaged, as we said, in their deadliest dispute in decades, the international community is now struggling to uh, address the crisis. How concerned you believe Western countries are and what kind of a threat those incidents pose on, for example, Europe's energy security? Well start with the last point. I mean, the pipelines and the other infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, whether digital or road or rail that go through Azerbaijan uh, are relatively removed from, from where the fighting is now. Uh, and, you know, the way pipeline security works is that were the pipelines to be damaged, they can be repaired very quickly uh, as long as uh, a hostile force doesn't seize the territory through which they run. And there's no chance of Armenia seizing that Azerbaijani territory. So I'm not worried about that. Um, and I'm not really so worried about this uh, uh, general conflagration. I mean, Elin can only go so far in, in saying what Azerbaijan's war aims are, uh, or, or you know, military operational aims are. In my opinion, what I think Azerbaijan is going to end up doing is a, a more limited operation than some people fear. I would mm -hmm. guess Azerbaijan is going to recover just some territory that is significant to enable Azerbaijani people to return to their homes mm -hmm. uh, and then prepare for the future, for the next round of negotiations from a stronger bargaining position. Yeah, we're running out of time, but Ambassador Elin, what's the end game for Azerbaijan? 
end game for Azerbaijan is to, to ensure peace and security for the entire region. First of all, of course, for our own people, but also for the region, including the people of Armenia and the Republic of Armenia. This is only, only is possible to liberation of Azerbaijan territories and the end of this occupation. This occupation does not only hurt Azerbaijan. It doesn't just displace our people. It has also uh, resulted in complete isolation uh, of Armenia, which has become a failed state. And therefore, it's, it's become a belligerent state. So as long as we do uh, achieve an uh, uh, end to this uh, occupation, the better it is for the entire region. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you.